up to this point in linear algebra, we've considered vectors as quantities that we can add and that we can multiply by scalars. The kinds of questions we've asked, when is a set of vectors linearly independent? When does a set of vectors span a subspace? When does a set of vectors form a basis for a subspace? The answers for these questions only depend on addition of vectors and scalar multiplication. Now, at no point do we mention the length of a vector. If we're doing physics, okay, we're always taking measurements. So the vectors we come across there always have a length and a direction attached to them. So for instance, if I have a velocity vector, okay, we have the direction of motion and the length or magnitude is just gonna be the speed which tells us how fast we're going. For here, we'll start off with the notion of the length of a vector and work our way up to definition of an inner product. Now, the first concept we start off with, if we have a non-zero vector, we could always factor it as, okay, the length of the vector times a direction. In this case, direction is gonna be given by a unit vector. Unit vectors are just vectors that have length equal to one. Now, start with the base case, the real numbers. So if we take any x in the real numbers, the length is going to be given by just taking absolute value. Now you'll note, I can rewrite this as the square root of x squared. Okay, it seems like a funny thing to do. But that'll be consistent with our general definition. Now what's happening here? We put a negative number into here, we square it, the negative goes away. When I take the square root, we're taking the positive square root. So this returns a positive number, that's just going to be our absolute value. Now. If x is non-zero, we could take x, divide by its length, or absolute value. This is going to give us a direction or a unit vector. Okay, note here, what the unit vectors are are just the numbers plus or minus one. So if I put in a positive number, we're pointed in the positive direction. If we put in a negative number, we'll be pointed in the negative direction. Okay, and if we have zero, there's no direction attached to it. So, punchline is, okay, at the end of the day, we can write x as absolute value of x times x over the absolute value of x, okay, the unit vector, if x is non-zero. Now, if we move the two dimensions, then the notions of length and direction are given by polar coordinates. So, if I have the non-zero vector, x, y, the length it's going to be equal to r, which is given by square root of x squared plus y squared. For our direction, we find theta, which is given by cosine theta equal to x over r, sine theta equal to y over r. Then we get a new vector with cosine theta and sine theta as the new coordinates. Now note, if we take the length of this new vector, which I call u, then its length is cosine squared plus sine squared, which is equal to 1. So this vector is a unit vector. If we take all unit vectors in the plane, we just get the unit circle. Finally, if we consider our factorization, okay, note our original vector is equal to its length, which is equal to r, times the unit vector, which is just gonna be x over r, y over r. So I get back xy if xy is non-zero. For a concrete example, let's let v be equal to minus two, two square roots of three. Then the length of v is just gonna be given by r, which is square root of four plus 12, which is equal to four. We divide v by four to get our unit vector. So we'll have minus a half, square root of three over two. If we think in terms of cosine and sine, then the theta that goes with this cosine and sine is two pi over three. Now, we should check that we have a unit vector here. So I'll take the square root of the sum of the squares. We get a fourth plus three fourths, which gives me one. Square root is one. So u is a unit vector. We consider v as a factorization of length and direction. What we have is four times our unit vector, which gives us minus two, two squares of three. And we see that we get v back. If we move to three dimensions, Let's suppose we have a non-zero vector x, y, z and r3. If we're interested in breaking things into 
lengths and directions, we can use spherical coordinates. Now, spherical coordinates, our length is going to be given by the quantity rho. So that's going to be given by square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. If we let rho be equal to 1, then I can square both sides, and we get x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. Our set of unit vectors is a set of all vectors on the unit sphere centered at the r origin. Now, for the other two quantities, okay, we're trying to pinpoint points that are on a sphere or a globe. So we're going to use longitude and latitude. So we're going to have two angles, theta and phi. To measure theta, what we do is we're going to go to the xy plane in three space. So it's right here. I'm going to measure theta off of the positive x-axis in the direction of the positive y-axis. Once I have theta nailed down, let's go determine a plane that's parallel to the z-axis, okay, like that. Now, in that plane, we're going to take our phi, and we're going to measure that down from the North Pole in that plane. So that's going to give us a line. Then all I need is our row to tell us how far out to go on that line. So that's how we get points in three space using spherical coordinates. Now note, if I fix a theta, I let our row vary from zero to pi. Okay, so it's going to go up and down like that. That gives us a longitude line. If I fix a phi and let theta vary, okay, so from zero to two pi, that's just going to go in a circle, so we get a latitude line. Getting back to factorizations, we have our formula for rho. If v is a non-zero vector, then I can find the unit vector point in the same direction by dividing by rho. So we have this formula here. If we wanted to find theta and phi that go with our unit vector, we have these equations here. But this problem is better suited for a multivariable calculus class. So we just leave it at that. Now, we have our factorization for non-zero v. v equals rho times u. For a concrete example, let's consider v equal to 2, 2 squared to 2, minus 2. Our rho in this case is going to be given by 4. The unit vector, in the same direction as our v, is going to be given by 1 half, squared to 2 over 2, minus 1 over 2. If we take the length of u, I get 1 fourth plus 1 half plus 1 fourth, which is equal to 1. So u is, in fact, a unit vector. Finally, we see that our factorization also checks out. Now, how do we define lengths for vectors in R4, R5, and so on? We look at our definition for length for R1, R2, R3, and extend naturally. So if we have a vector v in Rn, set as coordinates x1 through xn, then the length of v is given by the square root of the sum of the squares of the coordinates. Now, let's check this out by considering how we get the length of vectors in R3 from the length of vectors in R2. Now, from an R2, suppose I have a vector v, say xy, with both x and y positive. Then we can attach a right triangle to our vector v, okay, so it's running along the hypotenuse. Then by the Pythagorean theorem, we have the length of the vector, which is r. r squared equals x squared plus y squared. Now, if I go to r3, let's suppose our vector v now is x, y, z, with x, y, and z positive. First, we start in the x, y plane. So we're going to have our picture as before. So the length of the hypotenuse is r. And we're going to move this to x, y, z space, so our three space. So we have our xy plane here. So what's missing to get to our point is the height, okay, the z coordinate. Now, this is going to form another right triangle, so we apply the Pythagorean theorem again. We're going to have, okay, the length of the hypotenuse is rho, the length of our vector. So we have rho squared equals r squared plus z squared, but r squared is x squared plus y squared. So we're just going to get our definition for rho from before. Now, we can think of this as a crank, so I want to go from r to the n minus 1 to rn. So the picture is going to be like this. We're going to have, 
okay, where we had the xy plane, we're gonna think of that as r n minus one, taking up coordinates for, from one to n minus one. Our height is gonna be given by x sub n, which is gonna be in the nth coordinate. Then we apply the Pythagorean theorem, assuming I have the length of a vector in our x1 through xn minus one plane here. So the length of the base is just gonna be square root of x1 squared up through x sub n minus one squared. The height is gonna have length square root of x sub n squared. Then applying the Pythagorean theorem, we have the length of the hypotenuse to be what we're expecting up in our definition here. Now that we have a definition of length for vectors in Rn, if I have a non-zero v, we could divide by the length of v to get the unit vector that points in the same direction as v. And with that, we have our factorization of v into a length and a direction. Now, if I take the set of all unit vectors in Rn, so they're gonna be the vectors whose coordinates satisfy the equation, x1 squared plus x2 squared up through xn squared equals one. This is how we define the n minus one dimensional unit sphere in Rn. So we can't visualize this object, okay? We can only see in 3D, but we know the points on this object as the points that are distance one from the origin in Rn. Now, let's do one last factorization example. So I'll have two zero minus one two zero and r five. Take the length of our vector. Okay, we're gonna get a three. If we divide our vector by the three, we're gonna get the unit vector that points in the same direction. If we take the length of this unit vector, okay, we're at four ninths plus one ninth plus four ninths, which is equal to one. So the length of this vector is equal to one and we have a unit vector as expected. Then we could take our u, multiply it by our length, and then we see that we get back our original vector.